In this lesson, we're going to look at how we save energy in our home. The first aim is to describe different energy saving methods we can use at home, then explain how to calculate payback time, and then finally explain how you get charged for energy use. Obviously, if we're saving energy, we are saving money, and that's useful for us all. There are many ways to save energy in the home. Some are more expensive than others. Some are much more difficult to install than others. So let's start off with the simple ones. Remember, what we really mean by saving energy is taking steps to reduce the need to have your heating on. So if your house is better at trapping heat, you will not need to have the heating on for as long and you'll save yourself money. So how do we trap heat? Well, quite simply, one of the first things we can do is use thick curtains. Secondly, becoming very popular is double glazing. That's when we have two layers of glass to trap air in between and air is a good insulator. It keeps heat in our house. We can use draft proofing from simple things like snake draft excluders. I'm assuming you know what these are. They're not really snakes. They're long cuddly toys you put at the base of a door to stop draft getting through. But if you're not in a playful mood, you can simply say strips of foam that we place around doors and windows to stop draft getting through. In your house, you have a boiler which is connected to a water tank. If you surround that boiler with insulating foam, that's called a hot water tank jacket and that can also insulate heat and make sure it's not escaping so it's directed to where you need it. It's quite common to put fiberglass in our loft as a form of insulation. Remember, heat rises. We actually lose most of our heat from the top of our house, so loft insulation can be a big money saver. And finally, many houses have spaces in between their walls. We call this a cavity, and if we fill that cavity with foam, then we have cavity wall insulation, which again, reduces the amount of heat that's escaping our house. All these strategies keep our house warmer for longer, and therefore save money. And that's how we describe different energy saving methods we can use at home. Now we'll look at the idea of payback time and how to calculate it. Payback time is the idea that when we install such energy saving devices, they save us money. So every year, each one of these devices save us a certain amount of money. That money saved actually pays for the cost of installing such devices. The amount of time it takes for the savings you make every year, the annual savings, to equal the cost of installation is called the payback time. In this equation, the cost of installation is measured in pounds, annual savings is also measured in pounds, and payback time is measured in years. So let's look at a few examples. So, loft installation costs £200, that's the cost of installation. But every year, it saves you £100 in energy. So that means it will take two years before you pay back the cost of installation. In other words, cost of installation, 200, divided by annual savings, 100 pounds, gives you payback time, two years. Now, if we look at cavity wall insulation, the cost is 150 pounds. The annual savings are 100 pounds. So 150 divided by 100 will give you a payback time of 1.5 years, one and a half years. So in one and a half years, you would have made your money back and then everything else is profit. Let's look at one more example, double glazing as it's very common. The cost is £2,400, that's very expensive. And the annual savings by contrast are only £80. So £2,400 divided by 80 gives you a payback time of 30 years, much longer. So you can use payback time to evaluate how cost effective an energy saving strategy is. Like you can't deny the cost effectiveness of using loft insulation and cavity wall insulation. Whereas you might want to reconsider double glazing, as it clearly isn't as cost effective. It's interesting then to think why do most people use double glazing, but not everyone will necessarily have cavity wall insulation. In fact, nowadays the government often subsidises companies to offer cavity wall insulation for free, as the whole world benefits from energy saving, especially considering our current environmental circumstances. But in exams, they won't necessarily give you nice, tidy little data packages like this. More likely, you'll have a written question like this. So, it says a solar cell costs £4,000 to install. Each year, you pay £500 to your electricity suppliers. Calculate the payback time. Now, this question has the ability to throw you off course. It basically depends on you interpreting it correctly. Basically, what it's saying is every year, you pay £500 to your electricity suppliers. However, now that you have solar cells installed on your roof, you no longer need to give your electricity suppliers £500 every year. So this becomes your annual saving. 
So now you can interpret the question properly. Cost of insulation is £4,000 and we now know we're saving £500 every year because we're not paying it back to our electricity suppliers because we're making our own electricity. So now the question's easy. It's just 4,000 divided by 500. So it'll take eight years for you to pay back the money that you paid for installing the solar cells. In exams, sometimes they can give you data for two types of energy saving strategies, and you can perform this calculation to evaluate which one's more cost effective. And that's how we calculate payback time. So in the next bit, I'm going to explain how you get charged for energy use. You might want to pause before each calculation after I've given you an example to see if you can work it out first. Now we're going to look at how we get charged for electricity. In other words, what determines how much electricity supplies charge us for using electricity. Firstly, remember electricity is a form of energy. And energy is measured in joules, J. A thousand joules makes one kilojoule, Kj, small k, big J. Joules is named after the physicist James Joule, so it has to be a capital letter, like Newton's. The problem with using joules as a unit here is that joules are so small that if we received information in terms of joules on our electricity bill, numbers would look huge and be very difficult to understand. Even using kilojoules doesn't remedy this problem. So we need to use a more sensible unit. So this is how we work it out. The amount of energy we use depends on the amount of electrical power an appliance draws from the main supply over the time it's left on for. Here, electrical power is measured in kilowatts and time is measured in hours. Now, this logically makes sense. If we switch an electrical device on, then it will be drawing power from our mains. Depending on how much power it draws is dependent on the time we leave it on for. The longer we leave it on for and the more power it draws, the more we have to pay. So electrical companies charge us for energy use in kilowatt hours. This also sorts out the problem of having huge numbers on your electricity bill. Electricity meters you find in your home, like my one here, gives you a reading in kilowatt hours. And your electricity company just simply charges you for the amount of kilowatt hours used every month or every year, depending on the terms of your contract. So what you'll need to calculate in the exam is the cost of running a specific appliance. And you do this using this equation which you find on the front sheet of your exams. Power in kilowatts times time in hours times the cost of one kilowatt hour. Now this will usually be measured in pennies. And this is what electrical companies compete over to win you as a customer. The lower this cost, the more likely you are to subscribe to that specific supplier of electricity. So electrical companies compete over the cost of one kilowatt hour. The lower the cost or tariff, the more popular that electricity supplier is likely to be. Okay, so let's put this equation into action. So every electrical appliance you own has a sticker on it with a power rating on it in watts. Now I've just run around my home snapping photos of various appliances in my home with their power ratings. And this will give you an idea of how expensive these items are to run. So let's look at the laptop first. Now you can see here that the power says 90 watts, that's the power rating. Now if you remember, power in our formula has to be in kilowatts, so we have to turn 90 watts into kilowatts. To do that, we just divide by 1,000. So watts to kilowatts is simply dividing by 1,000, and there we will get 0 0.09 kilowatts. Now let's say we've been using the laptop or it's been left on for three hours. And let's make the cost of one kilowatt hour really simple, just 10p, which isn't too unrealistic. So you simply multiply 0 0.09, because remember we're dealing with kilowatts, not watts, times 3 times 10, which will give us a cost of 2.7p over the 3 hour period we were using our laptop, so not too bad. So now let's look at some hair straighteners. Here you can see the power rating is 150 watts. Now I'm not an expert on the matter, let's say that one session of using a hair straightener takes about 15 minutes. So once again, turn the watt value into kilowatts by dividing by 1,000. So we have 0 0.15 kilowatts. Remember, because we're moving that decimal point back three spaces. So 0 0.15 kilowatts. So here we do 0 0.15 for kilowatts, and we do 0 0.25 hours for time. Now remember, 15 minutes is a quarter of an hour. So one hour is given the value of one. So a quarter must be 0 0.25. Just divide one by four. Sometimes you might need to convert minutes into hours. To do that, you just need to divide your minute value by 60, because there's 60 minutes in an hour. 
So 0.15 times 0.25 times 10p gives you a cost of 0.375p for using hair straighteners for 15 minutes. But if you're anything like my family who frequently forget to switch them off, and let's say they run all day for about eight hours while we're away at work. So we change that value to eight, just in case you do the same thing and you're interested to see how much more it costs. Well, that will give you a value of 12p. A lot more expensive, but it's not going to break the bank balance, hopefully. So now let's look at my kettle, which has got loads of lime scale. I probably should have washed that before showing it to you, but anyway. Here, the power rating at maximum is 3,000 watts. So 3,000 watts is 3 kilowatts. Remember, divide by 1,000. And let's say a kettle takes about 5 minutes to boil water. So we have to divide 5 by 60 to work out the time in hours. So here we have 3 kilowatts times by 0.08 hours. That's what you get if you perform this operation, times by 10p. And that will give you an answer of 2.4p, which doesn't sound like a lot, but remember you've only been using it for five minutes. So what's quite interesting is to be able to compare the relative cost of using a specific appliance. So what I've done here is I've scaled all the values up or down so that they've all been used for one hour. Now I know that's unrealistic for a kettle, but just for the sake of comparison, you can see that for one hour a laptop costs 0.9p, using a hair straightener for one hour 1.5p, but using a kettle for one hour 28.8p. And this is the point, devices that basically heat things up a lot cost a lot more to run. If you remember my story from a previous tutorial on the blackout, well now you can understand that basically kettles draw a lot of energy, a lot more than your standard domestic appliance. So now we can explain how you get charged for energy use.